Thank you for watching this virtual lecture event hosted by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. We also offer the opportunity to take a single course without having to pay an entire semester's worth of tuition costs. One can also audit such a course at a much less cost. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. This evening, we'll be hearing from Mr. Peter Husey. Mr. Husey is the Director of Strategic Deterrence Studies at the Mitchell Institute on Aerospace Studies and the president of his own defense consulting firm, Geostrategic Analysis, which was founded in 1981. Mr. Husey has served as an expert defense and national security analyst for over 45 years. His specialty is developing and implementing public policy campaigns to secure support for important national security objectives. He has lectured around the world and across the US on nuclear terrorism, nuclear deterrence, missile defense, homeland security, counterterrorism policy, and strategic threats to the US and its allies. Mr. Husey, welcome and thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much and thank uh, the Institute of World Politics uh, for your help. Today, what I'm gonna talk about is where should we go on arms control and the role of Global Zero, as well as those who are concerned that arms control is not verifiable, uh, to look at both sides of that equation and see how they're affecting our ability to use arms control for our security. First, I wanna start with the historical accomplishments of arms control from SALT to start. The thing the SALT Treaty did in 1972 was it basically accommodated a five-fold increase in Soviet warheads. Went from about 2,500 up to over 12,000 by the middle of the decade of the 1980s. It opened up something what was known as the window of vulnerability, where the huge Soviet advantage in multiple warhead land-based missiles, which are on alert words of 95 to 99% of the time, could take out so many of the American forces in one strike, leaving the Russians still with huge numbers of warheads and they could use that for blackmail purposes. For the Russians themselves, the Soviets, they thought the correlation of forces in the 1970s had moved very decidedly in their favor. And one of the things they talked about a great deal was the heavy MIRV land-based missiles that they were deploying under the SALT Treaty gave them that advantage. At the same time, if you remember, the ABM Treaty was agreed to in 1972. That was ratified by the United States Senate and it banned missile defenses except for uh, 100 interceptors you could have around your capital city, which the United States couldn't do because politically you couldn't defend Washington DC but uh, without defending the rest of the country. When Reagan came on in his president, the SALT II Treaty had been withdrawn from the Senate by President Carter because of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And what the SALT II Treaty did was simply continue the growth envisioned by the SALT I Treaty that accommodated, again, a very large increase in Soviet and American nuclear forces, particularly adding huge numbers of warheads uh, to each system. When Reagan came in, the staff at the National Security Council put together a number of national security defense directives, which numbered over his entire eight years, over a thousand dealing with nuclear weapons, the INF Treaty, START, uh, Latin America and Central America, major national security issues. And what they proposed, and Reagan gave a speech in December of 1981, which laid this out that we would try to reduce nuclear weapons on both sides by at least 50%. These are the strategic long range systems. And we would do this by emphasizing a force structure that emphasized going to sea, meaning submarines, keep the bomber force viable by having both conventional and nuclear and leaving your conventional weapons uh, not counted and bring eventually land-based missiles down to one warhead each which we put into SART II. The idea there is a single warhead RV on a land-based missile, even if on alert 97, 98% of the time, is not going to be used to preemptively disarm an adversary. And also the forces would have a hedge or upload capability, but this would be 
an upload capability, but not a breakout, meaning you wouldn't all of a sudden wake up in a matter of months and see the other guy with thousands of additional warheads that you didn't expect them to have. The second thing Reagan did was propose to the Soviet Union two things. We would deploy the Pershings and Glickums, ground launch cruise missiles in Europe to counter the Soviet SS-20s. No INF missiles on the part of the United States had been deployed at this time. And the Soviet strategy was to split NATO between the United States supporting the deployment of missiles and Germany and Britain, for example, and get other NATO countries to oppose this. They used, they spent millions and millions of dollars in a campaign to stop us from deploying these missiles. And thank God, Margaret Thatcher and Helmut Kohl and the Prime Minister of Italy and also the Dutch all supported the deployment of these missiles. Remember, they were deployed in Europe and in Asia. And what happened is Reagan also said that as well as deploying these missiles, we'll propose a zero-zero option. We'll get rid of all of them and you get rid of all of yours, Russia or the Soviets. And we'll call it, uh, that was the INF Treaty that actually was accomplished in 1987 when the President and Mr. Gorbachev signed a treaty for the first time getting rid of a whole uh, class of nuclear war uh, missiles and warheads. Now, once you did the INF treaty and then you did START 1 and then START 2, START 2 reduced them from 6,000 down to 3,500. And what that did is something quite interesting. Uh, we said, let's ban multiple warhead land-based missiles. And though Yeltsin and Mr. Bush signed the treaty in January 1993, unfortunately, uh, the treaty was not approved by the Duma in Russia in the same form. In fact, it took almost eight years. But in 2000, at the end of the Clinton administration, the Duma said, well, we'll approve the treaty, but on one condition. All missile defense has to remain in the laboratory. Of course, that was a non-starter. The Senate wouldn't approve it. And even though the Clinton administration had taken most of Reagan's SDI out of the defense budget, in 1998, Congress passed and the President Clinton signed into law a Missile Defense Act, which required the United States to deploy a missile defense system when technologically ready against rogue states such as North Korea. Uh, because of the North Korean tests of ballistic missiles uh, shook the United States when it happened in 1998, we really didn't think that the North Koreans could do this. And so instead of going along with the Clinton administration plan of not building any defenses for America, we kept the ABM treaty and in 1998, 1999, excuse me, we passed the Missile Defense Act. Now, it took George Bush 43 when he came in, he said, let's do another round of nuclear weapons reductions. And that was reducing them from the start one level of 6,000 because start two hadn't gone into effect, was not a treaty yet. Bush said, let's go from 6,000 down to 2,200. That was the largest reduction in strategic nuclear weapons ever agreed to in a treaty. And he and Gorbachev, uh, he and, excuse me, Mr. Putin signed off on that. At the same time, the president said, I'm going to leave the ABM treaty, uh, remove, remove it from the laws of the United States, and we will move towards a deployment of limited missile defenses as envisioned by the 1998 Missile Defense Act, excuse me, the 1999 Missile Defense Act. So what you had under SORT is you went down to 2,200 warheads. And so you start with 2,500 under SALT, you go up to 12,000, you come down to 6,000 under START 1, and then you go to 2,200 under what was known as the Strategic Offensive Reduction Talks or SORT, known as the Moscow Treaty. And then shortly thereafter, another little less than a decade when Mr. Obama was our president, he put together a new START treaty, which reduced the platforms, meaning missiles and bombers from about 1,100 to 700, and reduced nuclear weapons down to a notional 1,550, but it didn't include bomb bombers. That 60 bombers could have as many warheads as you wanted. And when you add those back in, the number was basically very close to the Moscow Treaty of 2,200. 
the thing that the new START treaty did that the START one treaty did not was that there was no requirement that each missile have only a limited number of warheads. Meaning we can inspect a missile and it could have one, two, three, five, ten warheads. And we can expect inspect ten missiles in a class over a year. And we can find each of the missiles has a number of warheads. It's not a violation of the treaty, no matter how many warheads it has. We can assume that, well, maybe the Russians we thought would only have three warheads per such missile, and now they have four. But it's not a violation of the treaty. So when the State Department says they haven't violated the treaty. The only part of the treaty that is really verifiable is the 700 missile and bomber ceiling. Now that's quite a reduction from the 1972 SALT treaty that allowed almost 2,400 to 2,500 missiles and bombers in our inventory. So what's interesting is Mr. Putin agreed with Mr. Bush that even in the absence of the ABM treaty, he'd agree to a Moscow treaty to reduce nuclear weapons to 2200, and then followed that up with agreeing with Mr. Obama to reduce nuclear weapons down to 1550, notionally. Now, what was the basis of the SALT process? The SALT process was politically to support detente, look as though you were for peace, while at the same time building weapons. The problem is we didn't buy the MX missile during the 70s. We slowed the C-4 missile and the Ohio-class submarine. We killed the B-1 bomber, and the B-2 bomber remained in rdt and &E. So why we managed a very large buildup of Soviet forces, and we merved both our Minuteman III and our Poseidon forces, so we kept up in terms of warheads, we did not modernize our force structure or platforms. And so at the end of the decade, when President Reagan came into office, he was facing a requirement to modernize all our nuclear platforms, subs, land-based missiles, and bombers simultaneously. At the same time, the only treaty in existence was the SALT-1 treaty, Start two having, the SALT-2 having been uh, withdrawn from the uh, Senate by President Carter. And a Russia that thought they, the Russians, the Soviets, were kind of king of the heap in the world of strategic nuclear stuff, as well as 18 countries, if you remember, during the 1970s fell to communism, as well as countries like Iran flipped from the US orbit to, at best, uh, maybe not totally in bed with the Russians or Soviets, but certainly totally opposed to the United States. What Reagan came in and did with the start process was he said, Instead of looking at missile, uh, nuclear weapons modernization and arms control as opposite ends of the same spectrum, he said, why don't we combine them? We will modernize not a larger force, but a smaller force, a smaller force that will get through arms control, but we'll still modernize it to make it effective and credible. And we'll add something to it. We'll add missile defense. And so he added a missile defense component in 1983 and though Mr. Aspen, our Secretary of Defense, took it out in 1993, in 1999, as I said, the Missile Defense Act was passed by Congress that required the deployment of missile defenses. And then George Bush in, 19, in 2003 finally took out the ABM Treaty altogether. So the argument that had been made back in 1972 that you had to have no defenses in order to reassure our friends in Moscow that they could reduce nuclear weapons without having to worry about America building a formidable defense against them. That wasn't the case. What happened is even without missile defenses, we built up our nuclear weapons from 2,500 to well over 10,000. And then even though we cut our nuclear warheads from 12,000 to six, further reductions from 6,000 to 1550 all occurred when there was no ABM treaty and we could build missile defenses. So where does that put us now? The big issue on the table, a lot of people say, is, oh, let's extend the New START Treaty another five years. The President of the United States can just certify, let's do it. Mr. Putin has to ask, I believe, the Duma in Russia to do it. Here are the problems. 
verification under the New START Treaty is poorer than it was under the START One Treaty. And a couple of my colleagues, mainly Jim Howe and Mark Schneider, have looked at how many warheads can the Russians deploy under the New START Treaty. And I have some charts that I'll be publishing soon that indicate that the Russians can deploy upwards of about 4,400 warheads, which is 3,000 warheads more than the notional number under uh, the New START Treaty. What about for the United States? We could add 800 Minuteman missile warheads by going from one to three warheads. It would take almost four years to do that. And with the D-5 missile on the 12 new Columbia class submarines and 16 missiles per sub, you could build another 384 warheads. Now that assumes a couple things. It assumes we have enough tritium to produce these warheads and that the warheads are gonna be available. But if you add that up, that's about 1200 warheads, which would give us, when you add it together with the 1550 we have, about 2700, and then you can add in bomber weapons, we would still be considerably underneath the Russian number, particularly that the Russians on the backfire bomber, for example, is not included. So we have a dilemma there. Should we extend New START even though the Russian ability to build up is quite formidable, even under the treaty. Second issue is, could we possibly revive the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Agreement that Russia seriously violated at least since 2009? And because they violated it, even though the Obama and Trump administrations tried to get the Russians to, one, acknowledge their violation, two, to come back into the treaty, we have a problem. The Russians have no interest in coming back in the treaty, and that's why the United States said, well, you can't have a treaty between two parties when there's only one party. The other thing is China has fielded thousands of INF range missiles, which are between 5,000 kilometers at the, high, at the top end and 500 kilometers at the bottom. So it's hard for us to go back into a treaty to prevent us from building INF missiles anywhere when the Chinese have thousands of them and the Russians are violating it anyway. So to claim that this administration has been against arms control and jettisoning arms control agreements, not fair. Uh, the INF treaty was uh, beat up and torn up by the Russians, not the United States. The third issue we face is instead of extending New START, what if we went to a lower level of nuclear weapons, say a thousand from 1550? The problem here is you either have to kill a very substantial section of your Minuteman missiles to get to a thousand or retire four submarines or some combination. And when you kill ICBMs to get down to a thousand warheads, for example, you'd end up with three bomber bases, two sub bases, and maybe five submarines at sea, meaning 10 strategic nuclear assets that if destroyed would put the United States out of the business. Instead of having turned assets that the Russians and the Chinese have to worry about today, they have over 500 that we have. Going from 500 to 10, in my mind, making it easier for our adversaries to take out our nuclear assets to me is a non-starter. Other people say, well, let's trade away missile defenses. Well, what would we get from China and Russia if we did that, or just Russia? We still wouldn't get anything from the North Korea or Iran or other potential adversaries that do have missiles. Uh, North Korea has nukes, Iran is trying to get them. We would have no defense against missiles from those countries. So the idea of trading away our missile defenses to get something from Russia and China, again, is a non-starter. One of the most important things we might do is there are a lot of regional, smaller nuclear weapons. Now, I know people think that a nuke is a nuke and just because it's got a lower yield than what we have on our strategic systems, it's still a bad weapon, and that's true. But there are thousands of these theater weapons that the Russians have. The Director of National Intelligence thinks at least 2,000. My friend Mark Schneider thinks upwards of five to 6,000. They're difficult to verify, but if you can verify them, should we do a cap on them and then reduce them? Or should we take all the theater systems, all the strategic systems, put them in one box and say you can have 
2,000 or 1,000 or 1,500 of them, but you have the freedom to mix them any way you want, but just subject to verification. Now, what about global zero? Why not just keep going, going down towards global zero? What's interesting is that how do you verify a country like North Korea or Pakistan or India or China? How do you verify that they've made any reductions, let alone gotten to zero? The idea that just further reductions without any market change in the nature of these regimes like Russia, China, or North Korea can somehow increase our security, I think is very dubious. One of the things that is the problem with Global Zero is those supporters are pushing very hard to combine going towards Global Zero, but also killing our land-based leg of the triad, our Minuteman Three and our GBSD. Uh, Dr. William Perry, who at the time was Secretary of Defense, uh, tried to kill ICBMs in the Nuclear Posture Review of 1994 and wasn't successful. It never actually got in the final document. Defense Secretary Mattis, when he came into the Pentagon in 2009, had told colleagues that he also was in favor of killing ICBMs, a position he had gotten from Dr. Perry when they were together at Stanford. Again, Secretary Mattis changed his mind after being briefed on this and said, no, that's not a very good idea. Unfortunately, a recent book by Dr. Perry proposes not only to kill ICBMs in order to further a goal towards global zero, but to cut two submarines from the Columbia class boats we are now building, eliminate all the cruise missiles for the bombers, and adopt a policy of no first use and de-alerting. Well, de-alerting and no first use are not verifiable. De-alerting means you just turn the missiles off. Well, you can't verify that they're turned off and you can't verify they're turned on, number one. Number two, no first use is a doctrine you can proclaim, but how is an adversary going to determine whether you're serious about it? Because you might also be inviting attack in, in so doing. In cutting two submarines from the 12 we're gonna buy, there's another problem in that because we won't have two submarines to replace the old ones going out of service, we won't have 12 overall boats in service or 10, which is Dr. Perry's proposal, but eight. And if you have only eight submarines in service, then you're talking about only two to three at sea at any one time. And basically what you've done is cut in half your day-to-day -day deterrent that you have deployed. And therefore, can you hold at risk the targets in Russia or China that you do today in order to maintain deterrence? And the answer is no. And as you go to very low numbers, there's a bigger problem in that without good verification, cheating really matters. Because if you're down around a thousand warheads and your adversary comes up with two or three or 400 new warheads that are deployed, uh, you have a serious problem because the strategic balance is going to be harmed. On the other hand, you can't beat something with nothing and Congress expects you to do something serious in the arms control business and unlike some of my friends, I'm actually in favor of arms control. I think the START One Treaty and the INF Treaty were both good. And I think it's unfortunately that we didn't agree and get the Russians to agree on the START Two Treaty. What fascinates me is Gorbachev himself took a wrote to the pages of the New York Times in 19, I think it was 1999, saying that the START Two Treaty by banning MIRV land-based missiles would bankrupt the Russians. Unfortunately, the Duma took his advice and said, yeah, I guess it would. What he meant was putting single warheads on land-based missiles means you have to build an awful lot of them to have a lot of warheads. Makes sense. On the other hand, if you go to sea, submarines are expensive. And only about a third of them or a little bit more, maybe 40% are on alert at any one time, ready to be used for deterrent purposes. And therefore, it's more expensive to do submarines than it is to do land-based missiles. That's a truism. But on the other hand, it's also far more survivable and therefore stabilizing in that very few of your warheads, in the case of the United States, 70% of our warheads are at sea. And even though those in port are vulnerable to an attack, a very significant number of our warheads simply cannot now be found or attacked. Also, it would be far better to agree 
to a ban on MERV land-based missiles, which we did under START II, and put that on the table without having to reduce the number of warheads. The Russians, of course, would be free to mix however wanted they are and are forced to have 1550. Also, the reason we have the very flexible bomber rules is 60 bombers are what count under the ceiling, but those bombers have anywhere over 400, 500 warheads of one kind or another on them. And what that does is it preserves our ability to have a bomber force uh, that's also conventional and doesn't count under the nuclear ceilings. And that conventional bomber force is a formidable deterrent in the conventional area. And therefore that reduces quite, or increases quite dramatically uh, the nuclear threshold and increases quite dramatically uh, the ability of conventional deterrence to maintain the peace. Particularly important for the bombers, of course, is to have cruise missiles. Dr. Perry thinks we should get rid of them, but that means every bomber would have to penetrate air defenses into Russia and go find an individual target to drop a gravity bomb on, as opposed to being able to stand off over a thousand kilometers from the periphery of the Soviet of the Russians and be able to launch multiple missiles at targets in Russia, that is a formidable deterrent capability. So if you go to sea, enhance your bombers, and make your land-based missiles non-first strike weapons, you dramatically increase stability, which is exactly what the United States has done, starting with the START-1 treaty, the SORT treaty, and now New START. Unfortunately, the Russians didn't get the message, and they have gone, not completely, but they've gone in the opposite direction where they put more and more of their forces at, on land in multiple warhead missiles uh, that have huge throw weight capability, meaning they can add a lot of warheads to those missiles. So the last part of this is very important. Again, this is contrary to the arms control orthodoxy. And the idea was, why not encourage missile and air defenses? Originally during the ABM treaty debates of the 1970s, the idea was, well, if the bad guys think we, America, are going to build defenses. They have to build more offense to overcome our defense. Uh, one critic of missile defense uh, said that uh, there's an old Chinese proverb that it means says, first the so uh, shield, then the sword. Well, there is no such Chinese proverb. And I understand what the individual is saying is that if we build a shield, which stops incoming warheads from blowing up New York, Somehow that means we're going to use our sword and attack the bad guys first and then soak up whatever missiles they can send back at us. Any American president would think that we could attack an adversary like Russia with thousands of nuclear weapons and survive a retaliatory strike of many, at a minimum, hundreds of nuclear weapons and that our missile defense would be perfect enough to stop such an attack is highly dubious argument. In fact, I think it's ridiculous. Unfor on the other hand, the idea of stopping a limited attack, what Mr. Putin has talked about, escalating to win in a regional crisis where he threatens to use one, two, maybe a dozen nuclear weapons to get us to stand down and not come to the defense of our allies at all, that any kind of missile defense that's robust and capable could actually do an extraordinary good job of defending against such a thing without having, we wouldn't have to argue that we could deal with hundreds of nuclear weapons simultaneously. Here we're talking about perhaps a couple dozen and they're a very sound missile defense, particularly a missile defense from space can do an extraordinary job. And in defending us, we would basically say to an adversary like Mr. Putin, no, you're not gonna threaten the use of nuclear weapons in a crisis and get us to stand down. We are going to protect our friends, the Baltics and NATO. We're gonna defend our friends, uh, the Taiwanese and the Republic of China in the Western Pacific. And yes, you, Russia, you are not going to use nuclear weapons in an aggressive manner and to establish greater hegemony over the uh, region that you're after. So therefore, if you look at looking at uh, the nuclear environment this way, arms control should serve deterrence and stability. And as opposed to taking an arbitrary number, pulling it out of the air and say, well, we have to go to a thousand warheads and you have to then mix your forces to get to that number, whether it's stabilizing or sound or not. 
Second issue is arms control, we have to understand, as Keith Payne has talked about in his new book, you cannot change an adversary or their relationship with them that view America as an enemy. You cannot change what they think through arms control. You can use arms control to make the deterrent balance better and improve it, but you're not going to change a country like China or North Korea or even Russia with arms control. Third, proliferation may be one of our biggest challenges. And even though we've been somewhat lucky, only North Korea and possibly Iran are the new nuclear clients on the block. When you start thinking of the potential of having five, six, seven, or eight new nuclear uh, aspirants out there and them all getting nuclear weapons and how that would play out in a crisis. It's bad enough if the United States, let's say in the Western Pacific, has to worry about Russia, China, North Korea, and how to deal with three nuclear armed powers in a crisis where we fear nuclear weapons might be used. That's a toughie. But as Henry Sikorsky has pointed out at the uh, uh, Proliferation Education Center, uh, proliferation has to get our attention. My view is the last thing we want to do is make less credible America's nuclear deterrent umbrella so that our friends, whether the Germans or whether the Japanese or whether the Koreans, South Koreans, feel that our nuclear umbrella is not credible enough and go down the nuclear path themselves, that would be a spur to proliferation that would be, I think, highly destabilizing and highly dangerous. The fourth point I want to make is many people point to the Bush Gorbachev PNI, meaning Presidential Nuclear Initiative, where in 1991, President Bush announced at the end of the Cold War, he's just going to take thousands of nuclear warheads off of our surface ships, uh, take them out of our army forces in Europe. These were the theater systems that measured literally in the thousands. And President Bush said, I'll unilaterally take them down. And Mr. Gorbachev would then pledge also to do the same. The thing is, it is unclear to me the extent to which we've been able to verify such reductions. We do know that in the Eastern Bloc of the Warsaw Pact, those weapons are gone because these countries are now independent and not part of the Soviet empire anymore. But there is a serious problem with, can you verify where these theater systems are. Also, in those days, the fear we had is that these weapons, uh, people would lose control over them and we wouldn't know where they were. And therefore, there was an enormous incentive to get these weapons and solidify them, control them, put them in storage bunkers, and then eliminate them and get them out of these countries so that we didn't all of a sudden have a sudden increase in a very large number of uh, nuclear powers even if they didn't have long range strategic systems, having regional nuclear weapons would be a problem. And therefore under the PNI, there was an incentive to get rid of these weapons, which in fact was done with this pretty extraordinary accomplishment, which you have to give uh, your hats off to both President uh, Bush 41 and Bill Clinton, because both administrations did an extraordinary job in getting those weapons uh, uh, put away. At least we think certainly on our part, but then, we're not quite sure. I still think that there's some issues with respect to uh, how many of the Russians have. Another point we make, and this is um, Henry Sikorsky sent me some proposals on this. Instead of focusing on just reducing nuclear warheads, which I think we shouldn't do, I think we should focus perhaps on delivery vehicles. Those are the bombers and the missiles. And it's easier to verify reductions or caps here. Uh, particularly given the fact that the Chinese that should be brought in on these discussions are very against any kind of intrusive inspection. And for example, do we put a ceiling on hypersonic capable vehicles? Do we put a ceiling on different kinds? That's certainly open to uh, also whether we should do the same with conventionally armed long range strike missiles. Uh, by deploying them, we certainly would challenge China and they may then pursue defenses against such conventional weapons, which maybe would diminish uh, their investment in nuclear forces. It's unclear to me, but those are all ideas I think we ought to put on the table. I do want to just say a couple of things with respect to 
why would the president propose that we bring China into the New START Treaty? There have been, I think, rather humorous ideas that, well, China has no business being part of the New START Treaty because they don't have 1,550 warheads. And we, the United States and Russia, we don't have 300 warheads is what the Chinese have. I would say first, we don't know how many warheads the Chinese have. There are credible indications, uh, believe it or not, from Russian sources that the Chinese may have anywhere from 1,100 to 1,800 total nuclear warheads. We don't know. And part of the idea of getting them in on discussions about nuclear weapons is to get them to be transparent, meaning let us uh, you know, show your cards on the table. Uh, to a large extent, the United States puts our cards on the table in the nuclear business. And with respect to Russia, we do know uh, considerably about the Russian systems as well, certainly far more than we uh, do with respect to the uh, uh, Chinese. And having said that, discussions with Russia and China would be valuable in that instead of looking at just reducing more nuclear warheads from whatever level we have today, 1550, to a lower number that ends in zero, that magically is going to get us somehow to zero, I would say we should look at stability issues and reducing systems that are first strike type weapons. And that given the fact that the New START Treaty is quite similar in numbers to the Moscow Treaty, the question is in the 20 years since the end of the ABM Treaty and the Moscow Treaty was signed, we're kind of at a level where it's going to be, I think, more difficult to go to lower levels at the same time preserve the stabilizing nature of the US nuclear triad. Again, we may need to maybe able to explore and reduce further, but I think we would be better off if we looked at how to stabilize the nuclear deterrent, plus put a cap on and then begin to reduce and then eliminate all theater systems, but also work to deploy missile defenses and air defenses, which can dramatically improve your ability to stop limited strikes, which is precisely what you wanna do given Mr. Putin's adoption of this idea of escalating to win, meaning threatening to use a limited number of nuclear weapons in a crisis in order to get the United States to stand down. Uh, my friend Rick Fisher has done a good deal of work in this area with respect to the Chinese. My worry is that the Chinese are also working to adopt a similar policy of escalating to win with respect to the Western Pacific and particularly with respect to the Republic of China or Taiwan. And with that, Hannah, that's I think 45 minutes. I'll be delighted to take questions. Yeah, we have um, a couple questions coming in. Um, the first one, regarding tritium, what part of our system is it critical to and which nations in the world mine, process, and sell it to us? Or do we have command of that market? That's a very good question. And I would reference my friend Mark Schneider, who does a lot of work in this area. Canada and Russia are where our tritium traditionally has come from. Our supplies are very limited. Without the tritium, you can't boost the warhead. And if you can't boost the warhead, you can't make a nuke. That's about how simple I can explain it. Um, I'm not a technically as proficient on that, but that is basically the issue is without an adequate supply of tritium, because it dissipates, there's a half-life to it, you do need to have new supplies of tritium. You can't just take it from one warhead to another. And that is one of the things we have to look at in terms of a hedge, We've always had a hedge to build up in case we, uh, the international environment deteriorated dramatically. On the other hand, you need to maintain what you already have. So yes, uh, Russia has the tritium in Canada uh, and that puts us uh, much more serious than uh, PPE. But again, as you know, if your supply chain is owned by your adversary, uh, that's not a good thing. So it's a good question. But again, uh, Mark Schneider is with the National Institute of Public Policy, NIP. I would recommend you go online and find some of his working on this because he is, in my mind, uh, one of the top two or three uh, nuclear specialists in the country. 
Next question. Um, you mentioned uncertainty or impossibility of verification of multiple kinds of negotiated limits. Should we be satisfied with our current verification tech or invest more heavily? Very good question. One of the things we don't have a discussion of in this country is, is a treaty verifiable? And even if it is, doesn't matter. Let me explain what I mean. We have the ability to go and look, I think, 10 times a year at a Russian missile system, which is the SS-24s. We can examine 10 of them. And when we open them up, we can see that they have a certain number of warheads. Now, the warheads may be under a cloth. They may be under a metal shroud. But the we can go to the base and be told, here's a list of all the missiles. And this is the warheads they have. And we can pick the one we want to go see. And they'll take us out to the missile silo or in the case of a mobile missile, that's much more problematical. And we can look at the missile and say, oh, it's got, you said it had three warheads. It's got three warheads. What has it told you? It told you on that day, that missile has three warheads. Has it told you that all missiles in that category have three warheads? No. Has it told you what the Russian total is? No. So the fact that the State Department and the official report said, well, the Russians are complying with that part of the treaty. The question is yes, but it doesn't mean anything insofar as are the Russians deploying more warheads than the notional 1550 that is allowed by the, the treaty. Now, I have to say in all due respect to the supporters of the New, New START Treaty, it does have a ceiling of 700 missiles and bombers. That is very critical. Uh, the question though is even with that number, the Russians can deploy 4,400 nuclear bombs on missiles or bombers. And that is considerably more than the United States has in its entire nuclear stockpile of 36, 3,700 warheads. Because a lot of our warheads are currently being dismantled and are going to be taken apart, which are not now usable. So when I see numbers in the press, the United States has 6,500 warheads and Russia has 7,200, I've seen those numbers. No, we have at most about 3,700. And of that, we have 15, probably 1,380 deployed on our bomber, on our submarines and land-based missiles. Our bombers have no warheads on them at any one day. They, are stand, they stand out. Uh, they may be used for conventional forces, but our nuclear capable bombers, B-52, our B-2s, have no nuclear warheads on them on a day-to-day -day basis. So as General Kaler has pointed out, we basically are in a dyad, meaning we have two nuclear systems. Now we can upload the bombers in a crisis, but not there yet. And we don't do that on a regular basis. So the issue in my mind is, can we really build up to the where the Russians can? And so verification is critical. Number two, mobile missiles are a problem. We can't monitor where they produce them. It used to be we could monitor the production facility, and as the missiles came out the door, we could say, oh, we can count them. We can't do that anymore. Another thing is telemetry, meaning we had to be furnished telemetry by the Soviets or the Russians, or we could take it, which means we track the missile when it's test fired. That tells us basically how many warheads, how big the missile is, and what it's capable of doing. It's called throw weight. And when you can't do that, you don't know necessarily how big the missile is and what it can be done. Those three things. Well, third, having every missile, you can only have three warheads on that missile, like start one. Or that missile was tested with three warheads, so we're going to assume that missile has three warheads on every missile in that class. So if you did attribution of warheads, telemetry, and portal monitoring, and added that to new start, and then agreed maybe to extend it, that would be far better than extending it without the new verification measures. Next question, um, what is the highest yielding warhead in our arsenal? I can't tell you, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> these things are, I've seen, we have estimates, the Federation of American Scientists, uh, Hans Christensen does a pretty good job of kind of estimating this, but, uh, we have we talk about our numbers which are on 400 kilotons up to a megaton or more. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, 
I can't imagine what it would happen if a megaton warhead landed anywhere in America. It's just the numbers are the, the force is so, I mean, the Russians have supposedly a weapon of a hundred megatons. This super, uh, they're talking about an underwater torpedo with a megaton that if detonated somewhere along North Carolina's coast would basically radioactively poison everything from Miami to Boston and bring the United States that whole area to collapse. I can't imagine. I mean, I, let me let me be clear. I'm not minimizing the extraordinary power of these weapons. Uh, in fact, I would say, given their unbelievable destructiveness, we have to do everything possible to make sure there is no incentive by any adversary of the United States to use nuclear weapons against us in a crisis or, God forbid, in a conventional conflict. That's why it is very, very important that we maintain a highly credible nuclear deterrent. And we haven't done anything in our nuclear deterrent. The last deterrent platform we bought was 1996. The next one is going to be 2029. That's over 30 years. And when you look at uh, when we've started uh, modernization under Ronald Reagan, we're talking about 40 years between modernization pathways. And then during that same period of time, the Russians have modernized twice. Another question. Can you please summarize again your reaction and key um, pints regarding New START expiring if it is not renewed? Well, here I'm, I have mixed feelings. I understand the need, the idea of, well, at least they have, we'll keep the 700 missile and bomber ceiling. And we'll keep the notional 1550 warheads, but I can't verify that. So on that hand, on the other hand, the verification measures absolutely have to be improved. I know the Russians oppose them. And that's the thing about it. We, we tend to get pressured by our media and the public uh, to make a deal, as opposed to telling the Russians we're going to get up from the table and no deal. Remember, when Reagan did that at Reykjavik, shortly thereafter, you got start one and start two. Sticking to your guns, so to speak, and being tough in negotiations is not a sign of being against arms control. It means you're being smart. And the thing is that we need to be very smart on this because as the numbers go down, cheating becomes very, very important. And as the Nuclear Posture Review pointed out in the new one that was written in 2018, there are growing nuclear dangers, particularly in the region, and particularly with China, Russia, North Korea, and so forth, and India and Pakistan. And remember, Syria tried to build a nuclear reactor with Korean technology. Iran has a very formidable nuclear capability. Again, it's a technology that can lead to nuclear weapons. So the world is not as benign as we thought it was at the end of uh, the uh, Cold War. So New START, I can see arguments for extending it, but I have arguments for not extending it. And my view is, as my colleague uh, Rebecca Heinrich pointed out, why not renew it for a year and at the same time put on the table, we need to have better in verification and mobile missiles are a problem that they can have under the New START Treaty. They're very difficult to verify because if you go to a base, the Russians can simply move the mobile missiles wherever they want to move them and you won't be able to find them. And that's a, that's a troubling thing. And that's one of the biggest drawbacks is that we need to look at these verification issues, which we usually don't. So again, I am very have very mixed feelings. I think there's a compromise where you extend it for a year in return for better verification. And then on mobile missiles, for example, I know my friend Mark Schneider does not think they're uh, verifiable under this agreement. So we need to go to another step to do that. So uh, I think in that case, we can be creative. The Russians may say no, we'll see. I think uh, the administration, I hope Marshall Billingsley, God love him, he does good work. Uh, he's got his work cut out for him, but I think Again, as General Hyten has pointed out, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, there are pros with respect to the treaty and there are cons. And I think we should be honest about both. What would you suggest as the best way for the U.S. to position itself for tough and effective negotiations going forward? Absolutely support 100% the modernization of our strategic nuclear deterrent and the NNSA work on warheads we cannot 
we technically, I think we could build, I've heard numbers of between zero and seven or eight warheads if pressed, if pushed. We have a, the Russians can build a thousand warheads uh, falling out of bed. It's like they, they, they build warheads like sausage at a, a beer festival in New York and Bavaria. We don't have that capability. We let our capability attrit. And same thing with respect to the bombers and ICBMs and the submarines. We're building everything now in sequence long after uh, our, we should have. A lot of our systems are going to become obsolete. Uh, we can't keep them around for longer than what is currently estimated. Our subs and our bombers and ICBMs have to be replaced between basically 2029 and starting in 2029 to 2032. That would be the most important thing we could do, fully modernize and then I must say to the House and Senate Armed Services Committee, they supported these systems 100% in their markups of the defense bill. Now the appropriators, being appropriators, um, took a couple, took $100 million out of uh, bombers and ICBMs and uh, they took some money out of the National uh, Security Administration, the, the National Nuclear Security Administration in terms of warhead money, uh, which hopefully the Senate will reverse. It was a very bad mark on their part and that sends a wrong missile a, a, a message. If we're not serious about modernizing our own deterrent. Do you think other countries that are our adversaries are going to take us seriously? So very good question. Okay, well, that looks like it's all the questions that we have. Um, I would like to thank Mr. Husey for joining us today and all of you who tuned in here on Zoom and Facebook. If you're interested in attending other upcoming webinar events, supporting IWP or applying to one of our graduate programs, please go to iwp.edu. Again, that's iwp.edu. Thank you very much.